Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2017 Royal Trail Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Trail Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Francois Terrien. Uh, Francois is curator of dinosaur paleoecology here at the Royal Trail Museum. He's originally from Montreal, Quebec, and obtained his undergraduate degree in geology at the University of Montreal. He then moved to the U.S. to pursue a master's degree in geoscience at the University of Rhode Island. For his thesis, Francois studied the paleo environments in which late Jurassic theropods lived in the American Southwest. Subsequently, Francois moved to Baltimore, Maryland to pursue his PhD in functional anatomy and evolution at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. For his dissertation, he studied the paleo environments of the latest Cretaceous dinosaur bearing formations of Romania. Fresh out of his PhD, Francois came to the Royal Trail Museum as an NSERC postdoctoral fellow and joined the ranks of the curators in 2006. Francois' primary research interests revolve around the study of late Cretaceous faunal and environmental change, as well as the study of dinosaur behavior. Over the years, he has conducted fieldwork in Canada, the US, Romania, and Mongolia. Today, Francois will talk about how the feathered dinosaurs discovered in Alberta a few years ago also changed the way paleontologists think about the evolution of wings. So without further delay, I present Dr. Francois Terrier. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, there's no denying that our perception of the physical appearance of dinosaurs has changed tremendously over the years. If we look back to the early 19th century, when the first fragmentary fossils were discovered, dinosaurs were thought to be giant snake-like reptiles that dwelled in swamps, or giant lizards that crawled uh, on the ground. Exemplifying this, here is the first illustration of a dinosaur ever published in a children's book in 1842. And it clearly shows that dinosaurs at the time were thought to be giant lizard-like animals. And if you're curious, that's actually a representation of Iguanodon, an uh, uh, herbivorous uh, ornithopod dinosaur. Then, by the mid-19th century, after the world-renowned anatomist Sir Richard Owen first formally coined the name dinosaurs, dinosaurs started changing in appearance. They were then being reconstructed as four-legged beasts with a more upright posture and more elephant-like proportions, which gave them a much more mammalian appearance. So they moved away from a clearly lower life form reptilian appearance to a life, uh, an appearance that was more typical of a higher life forms akin to what we see in mammals. Then with the discovery of the first North American dinosaurs in the second half of the 19th century, dinosaurs went through a renaissance. They were no longer being portrayed as lumbering beasts, but they were being portrayed as active and agile animals with an upright posture that was much more similar to what we see in humans. And uh, some representations even portrayed them with a tripodal posture, similar to uh, what we see in kangaroos, the only other type of quote unquote bipedal mammals that uh, were known at the time. And the trend to portray dinosaurs as bipedal animal was such extreme that some of our favorites, such as Stegosaurus, were first portrayed as bipedal animals. Then, as new discoveries were made, dinosaurs finally reached, by the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, an appearance that is more familiar to us, because those reconstructions filled the pages of our childhood books. So by that time, dinosaurs had reached an, a fully reptilian appearance, but it was recognized that some of them were quadrupedal, walked on four legs, while others were, bi were bipedal which was more in line with their, uh, their anatomy, what their anatomy was saying. That's not to say that some mistakes were not made along the way. For example, at one point, Stegosaurus was reconstructed with spikes sticking out of its back. Sauropods were reconstructed as sprawling animals or put into swamps. And my personal favorite here is a tyrannosaur trying to kick down, uh, to take down a, a hadrosaur by kicking it in the groin. I mean, <laughs> these guys had tiny little forelimbs, so 
I guess the, the artists looked at basically how kids take down bullies in the schoolyards and say, hey, that trick probably worked back in the Cretaceous as well. But overall, a fully reptilian appearance of dinosaurs was fully established by the early 20th century, although then there was already a hint that some of these animals may have been active animals and not just lumbering beasts dwelling in swamps. And then the reptilian appearance of dinosaurs would persist for almost 100 years until the late 1990s, until we discovered the first feathered dinosaurs. The discovery of three little skeletons in early Cretaceous rocks of China truly opened our eyes to a new look for dinosaurs. Closely associated with those skeletons, we could see evidence of uh, fur-like or hair-like feathers covering their bodies and some shafted feathers with barbs and barbules on their arms and legs. And those discoveries truly revealed that these animals were not scaly critters like lizards and snakes, but were actually feathered just like birds. So of course, these discoveries made the cover of scientific journals and popular science magazines alike, and they irrevocably changed the way we think of dinosaurs, the way we perceive their physical appearance. If the discovery of feathers had been restricted only to those three little dinosaurs, maybe it could have been called a fluke. But over the years, many new discoveries were made, such that today, in 2017, over 40 different types of dinosaurs, 40 different species of dinosaurs, are known to have been covered with feathers. Dinosaur, feathered dinosaurs have been discovered over a large portion of the world, mainly the northern continents, but predominantly from China. There's very few feathered dinosaurs known from elsewhere in the world. If we look more closely at the taxonomic affinity of the feathered dinosaurs, we can see that the vast majority of feathered dinosaurs belong to the group of theropods, the meat-eating dinosaurs. There are very few feathered ornithischians, or plant-eating dinosaurs. Then if we look more closely at the theropods, we'll see that, that we'll see some familiar names. For example, the ancestors of T-Rex were feathered animals. So does that mean that T-Rex may have been a feathered animal? Maybe, we'll have to wait for fossil evidence. But another household name is actually stands out, Velociraptor. Velociraptor of Jurassic Park fame is, was actually a feathered animal. So here you can see as it was portrayed, in the Jurassic Park movies. It was portrayed basically as an iguana on steroid, looking very lizard-like. But the reason why they portrayed it this way, that way is because the first Jurassic Park movie was released in 1993, a full five years before the first feathered dinosaurs were discovered, and 14 years before evidence of feathers was discovered in Velociraptor. Evidence of feathers in Velociraptor did not come in the form of feather impressions preserved in rock, but rather as bumps preserved on the ulna. The ulna is the funny bone part of the forearm of the animal. And if you look at the back edge of the ulna, you'll see a ser series of tiny little bumps that are regularly spaced along the back of the ulna. And these bumps are extremely similar to bumps we see on the back of the ulna of modern birds. So if we look at what those bumps uh, do in modern birds, we see that they are actually the anchor site for the attachment of flight feathers, of the root of flight feathers. So the fact that uh, Velociraptor had, uh, well, those features are called quill knobs. The fact that Velociraptor had quill knobs means that this animal not only had feathers, but also had wings. And if you're not convinced by the quill knobs of Velociraptor, here are the bones of a close relative of Velociraptor called Dakota Raptor. And you can see here more prominently, those quill knobs are very uh, pronounced and they would have been the insertion site or the attachment sites for feathers. So if you've eaten turkey during the Christmas holidays and you were the lucky one who ate the wing, you may have noticed some of those bumps on the back of the ulna. So this means it's time to actually update our perception of the physical appearance of Velociraptor. Instead of being reconstructed or portrayed as a, a, a very lizard-looking animal, it should instead be portrayed as a feathered animal. Or using a little bit of artistic license, may have looked a little bit like this. 
So we don't know the coloration or the colors of the plumage of the feathers of Velociraptor, but we know for sure that it was not a scaly animal. So the next time you see Velociraptor portrayed as a scaly animal in a movie or in books, you have to be aware that this is wrong. It goes against all scientific evidence. And if you're one of the people who think that you prefer your dinosaurs scaly because they're scarier than if they were feathered, well, just think of it this way. Reconstructing Velociraptor as a scaly animal is equivalent to reconstructing chickens as looking like this. So no wonder you may think that dinosaurs are scarier as scaly animals because that chicken is very freaky right there with all, all its feathers. So the big take home message is that Velociraptor was a feathered animal, not a scaly animal. Probably would have looked more like a bird, fully covered with feathers and with wings on its uh, forelimbs. So if we look at the phylogenetic distribution of, uh, of feathered dinosaurs on a cladogram or an evolutionary tree of, uh, of all dinosaurs, we can actually try to learn a little bit about the evolution of feathers in the ancestors of birds. So just to orient yourself on this graph, from, right to lef from left to right, you have time going towards the present. So you have Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous periods. Above the red line, you have the family tree of all meat-eating dinosaurs, the theropods. Below the red lines, you have all the plant-eating dinosaurs, including the big sauropods and the ornithischians. Within the green box there, nested well high up within the theropod family tree, you have birds, both extinct and living. So birds are meat-eating dinosaurs. And then if we plot on that, uh, uh, that evolutionary tree the occurrence of known feathered dinosaurs, we can see that the vast majority of feathered dinosaurs occur in the lineages leading to birds. There are very few feathered dinosaurs elsewhere in the evolutionary tree of dinosaurs. And that could be, for some species, we know for a fact that they had a scaly skin, but for some of them, we have no idea what their skin looked like. So it's possible that some of those gaps would have been filled by feathered dinosaurs. It's just that at the moment, yeah, we have some, uh, some gaps. We know, for example, sauropods, ceratopsians, and uh, hadrosaurs had scaly skins, but there's lots of other animals that, yeah, for which we have no idea. So the fact that the, we have a high concentration of feathered dinosaurs in the lineage leading to birds, it allows us to finally try to an answer questions that were first raised in 1861 when the first specimen of Archaeopteryx was discovered, namely, how did birds get their wings and learn to fly? If we look at the different types of feathers that are found in dinosaurs, we can usually group them into two broad categories, the filamentous feathers and the shafted feathers. Filamentous feathers are very uh, hair-like in appearance, and they cover the bodies of, uh, of dinosaurs. And there, these types of feathers, filamentous feathers, are usually found among the most primitive types of dinosaurs. Filamentous feathers are very similar to down feathers that we see in modern birds, as you can see here. And just like down, filamentous feathers probably served a purpose for insulation, to keep the animal warm or cool uh, relative to the environment. The other type of uh, feathers are shafted feathers. We call them shafted feathers because they have a rigid central shaft in the middle. And uh, those feathers are usually found among the more derived type of theropods, meaning those that are closest to modern birds. We usually find shafted feathers on the arms, legs, tails, and sometimes even on the body of, uh, of dinosaurs. Some uh, fossilized shafted feathers are very similar to contour feathers and flight feathers that we see in modern birds, but some fossilized shafted feathers are unlike anything that we see in the modern world. So for example, there are some examples of shafted feathers that are very rigid and very ribbon-like, and they're positioned on the tail of uh, some of these animals, and these feathers were probably used for display only and uh, did not play another uh, purpose another role. In contrast, we have some uh, fossilized shafted feathers that are very similar to modern feathers, and you find them on the wings and the legs of some dinosaurs, and those probably help 
for uh, gliding or even possibly flying in these animals. Uh, by studying uh, shafted feathers and their occurrence within dinosaurs, it's possible to try to reconstruct the evolutionary sequence that led to the evolution of wings and flight among the dinosaurian ancestors of birds. There's been three main theories or hypotheses that have been proposed to explain the origin of wings among dinosaurs. The first one is called the ground, called the ground up hypothesis, and it states that wings would have evolved among ground dwelling predators, among animals that stayed uh, on the ground. And these animals would have been uh, called upon to leap or bound to try to capture prey. And the hypothesis states that wings would have allowed these animals to jump higher or jump longer distances in order to capture prey. And then with time and evolutionary selection, these wings would have gotten bigger, would have allowed animals to jump higher or longer distances. And then eventually these animals realized that if they flapped their arms, their wings, they could actually start flying. So if that hypothesis is correct, we should expect to find wings in animals of all ages, from juveniles all the way to adults, because wings would have been critical for their survival, for their, uh, for their lifestyle. The second theory or hypothesis that's been suggested is called the tree down hypothesis. And uh, it states that wings would have evolved among arboreal or tree dwelling animals. In that hypothesis, wings would have allowed animals to either parachute down or glide from tree to tree while uh, looking for food. And then again, with time and evolutionary selection, some of those uh, gliding animals would have learned to flap their arms, their wings, and then that would have turned into powered flight. So if that hypothesis is valid, we'd expect again wings to be present in animals of all ages, especially in juveniles, because a fall off a tree could have been very deadly and would have prevented the animal from passing on its genes to the next generation. So wings should have been present in juveniles all the way to adults. And then about the about 10 years, 15 years ago, another theory was proposed called the wing-assisted incline running hypothesis, which is a mouthful when you try to say it fast. I guess the other hypotheses had simple names, so you tried to come up with something a little more challenging to say. But uh, in that uh, hypothesis, it states that wings should have evolved among land-dwelling, uh, ground-dwelling animals, but these animals would have flapped their wings not to start flying, but rather to push themselves down so that their feet would gain better traction while trying to climb up a steep hill or climb up a tree in order to escape a predator. And that hypothesis is based on actually observing modern birds. So here there's a team from the University of Montana that has filmed uh, birds, and you can see that these birds are flapping their wings. It's exactly the same motion as if they were flying, but instead of generating lift to take off, they're actually pushing themselves down so their feet gain better traction while climbing hills or obstacles. And you can see some of those slopes are actually greater than 90 degrees, very steep. And it's also a behavior you observe in the wild. It's not only in a lab that something scientists have concocted by putting birds in a lab. It's actually also happening in the wild. It's a natural, naturally occurring behavior. And again, that theory states that this uh, wings should have been present in animals of all ages because even juveniles would need to escape uh, predators. And indeed, if you observe young individuals, for example, this four-day-old partridge, you can see it's already flapping its tiny little wings to try to climb up that steep slope. And that behavior is maintained throughout uh, ontogeny, throughout the lifespan of the animal. So that hypothesis states that, yeah, maybe that's how wings first evolved. So we have three leading hypotheses uh, to explain the evolution of wings. All three are plausible, but all three are extremely difficult to test using the fossil record. It's very difficult to find a fossil that will actually provide more support for one or, or over the other uh, hypotheses. So there was a dilemma going on, not knowing which hypothesis was valid until 2012, when myself, Darla Zelensky from the UFC and a bunch of colleagues announced a big discovery that actually offered an alternative hypothesis for the origin of wings. So if we look at prior to 2012, we can see most of the feathered dinosaurs 
had been found in China. So it really restricted the size of the pool from which we could draw fossils in order to try to explain the origin of wings. And then in 2012, we announced the discovery of the first feathered dinosaurs in the New World, discovered here in Alberta. So three specimens were discovered in southern Alberta. Two of them were found here in Drumheller, not, uh, one not far from downtown and the other one not far from the museum. They were found in rocks that are about 71.5 million years old. And another one had been found nearly 15 years uh, prior in Dinosaur Provincial Park in rocks that are slightly older, roughly 77 million years old. The three specimens were discovered belong to a group of dinosaurs called Ornithomimids or ostrich mimic dinosaurs. Two of them are represented by nearly complete skeletons, which is great, and one of them was a very partial, uh, incomplete specimen. And of course, those specimens were uh, discovered in the beautiful badlands of uh, southern Alberta, where there's very limited vegetation, maximum exposure, so it's really a uh, paradise for all paleontologists in, uh, in search of new fossils. So this is what the first specimen looked like when, we first, uh, when it was first discovered. It wasn't very impressive. You can see here in the background Frank Hadfield, local resident who actually found the first specimen. You can see the specimen was actually discovered in a hoodoo, which is that pillar-like rock formation capped by a, uh, an erosion-resistant uh, capstone. And you can see at the back of the rock there's some orange staining. So those are the, the bones of the animal that were exposed. You can see here that what we were dealing with at the time wasn't very promising. You can see broken bones of the hips and the legs. So all that indicated the animal, or the skeleton, had been exposed for a long time and had eroded away. But still, we were hopeful that something, uh, at least the, the front half of the animal, would be present in uh, the capstone. So I brought a team to begin the excavation, and then as we start removing uh, rock from the capstone to make uh, the rock bigger and to make sure that we had the, the front half of the animal really in the capstone, that's when I had a lucky break. I flipped a piece of rock and observed all those dark striations there, those filamentous striations preserved in the rock. So at the time, we started joking, saying that, hey, we're dealing with the first feathered dinosaurs from North America, woo -hoo! But uh, the full extent of the discovery was not revealed until a specimen was brought back to the museum and uh, prepared by, uh, we can say, our expert preparator, Donna McLeod, who did a fantastic job just exposing all the specimen. And that's how the true nature of the discovery was revealed. So here is the first specimen as it was fully prepared. You can see it's only the anterior portion of the animal. We have the shoulder blade there, backbones, neck, part of the head and it's along the back of the animal, as well as along the front, the neck, and the torso, that we found some evidence of filamentous feathers. Ooh. So, uh, so once the specimen was prepared, we started looking also at the bone histology, so the texture of the bones, because we can count the number of growth lines preserved in the bone, and that tells us how old the animal was. So by counting the number of growth lines, we saw that the animal was an adult, but the bones were not really what we were looking uh, for. We were actually looking along the back of the animal. Here we have a bunch of filamentous impressions. If we do a close-up there, you can see those dark streaks preserved in the white rock are basically the impressions of filamentous feathers. And what's interesting is that the dimensions and the preservation style of those filamentous feathers was basically nearly identical to what we saw in the Chinese feathered dinosaur. So that's how we knew that we're truly dealing with uh, filamentous feathers. The second specimen was reported the year after. It's a skeleton of a very small ornithomimid, a very young individual. Based on the bone texture, we know the animal died at about the age of one. And it is the smallest ornithomimid ever discovered in North America. So that uh, was very exciting. But again, this specimen preserved impressions of feathers on it. Covering the entirety of the body, we had the impressions of filamentous feathers preserved. And unlike the, the 2008 specimen, the filamentous feathers were not preserved as dark streaks in the rock, but they were preserved as a texture, as striations preserved in an ironstone coating that covered part of the animal. So that's how we knew this animal was fully covered 
by filamentous feathers. The third specimen was actually a specimen that had been discovered 15 years ago and had been on display for many, many years. It's commonly known as the plant locality Ornithomimid, was discovered in Dinosaur Provincial Park in 1995. And, uh, based on the bone histology, we know it's again a very large animal, about 3.6 meters long, fully grown. And what's interesting is that specimen does not preserve impressions of filamentous feathers. We think that they may have been present, but could have been destroyed inadvertently during preparation, because that specimen was discovered before the first feathered dinosaurs were even known. So it's possible that the technicians just didn't know what to look for and basically inadvertently destroyed the, uh, the feather impressions. Uh, that's probably true for countless specimens that were discovered in the early 20th century as well. But what's really interesting is that that specimen preserves strange markings on the bones of the forearm. So here, if we look closely at the bones of the forearms, we can see that it looks like someone went with a Sharpie and started drawing dash marks on the bones. But those are not fake. They are true fossilized impressions of something. But the question is, what is that something? It's impressions of what? So if you look at the dimensions, you can see they're totally wrong for filamentous feathers. The markings are three times wider, nine times shorter than filamentous feathers. So they have to be something else, but what exactly? So in order to interpret those markings, we actually relied on two lines of evidence. First one was the orientation of those markings. If you look at how the markings are oriented on the ulna, again, the funny bone in the forearm, you can see that the markings change in orientation. At mid-shaft, they're oriented roughly perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. And as you get towards the wrist, you can see that they rotate to become nearly parallel to the long axis of the bone. The second line of evidence is actually some of, uh, some of the markings are actually U-shaped or hook-shaped. So that tells us that the original structure that left the impression may not have been a solid structure, but could have been a hollow, a hollow structure that broke and left an impression of the hollow cavity as a U-shaped or hook-shaped structure. So we decided to have a look at modern birds and found some similarities in the wing of birds. So if you look here, this is a wing of a raven. If you look at the covert feathers, those are the wings that cover the top, uh, the feathers that cover the top of the wings. They do not form the, the edge of the wing. Those are flight feathers. But if you look at the orientation of the covert feathers on top of the wing, you can see that they change in orientation. They go from nearly perpendicular to the edge of the wing, and they rotate to Nearly, par whoops, nearly parallel to the edge of the wing when you get at the wrist. So that's consistent with what we saw in the large ornithomimid. Second line of evidence is if you look at uh, shafted feathers on the wings and you cut uh, the root or the calamus of the, the shaft, you can see it's actually a hollow tube, so it's a hollow structure. So the combination of the change in orientation of the markings and the hollow nature of the original structure suggests that those markings were produced by the root of covert feathers that formed a wing in the ornithomimid. So now we know that adult ornithomimids had wings, but what about the juveniles? Did they also possess wings? So we went back and looked at the juvenile again. Unfortunately, one of the arms was fully exposed, so there were no feather impressions associated with that arm, but there was a second arm preserved against, pressed against the body of the animal, and that arm was fully covered by a feather impression. So it was possible by focusing on that part of the animal to look for evidence of shafted feathers. So if we look up close at the, that region, you can see here this is where the arm would have been. You can see the impressions on the abdomen, the thigh, the thorax. You can see all those filamentous feathers. So if we look at the feather impressions associated with the forearm, there's no difference. It's the same type of filamentous uh, feathers preserved in that part of the body. So we don't have any evidence of a wing or of shafted feathers in that animal. So these discoveries allowed us to actually update uh, our perception of the appearance of these animals. Prior to the discovery, we thought that ornithomimids were just scaly looking uh, dinosaurs because we had never found evidence of uh, feathers in these animals, and many, many good specimens had been discovered for these animals. So we thought that maybe evolution had skipped a step and these animals did not have feathers. 
But now the specimens discovered in Alberta reveal that instead, these animals looked a lot more like ostriches, just like their anatomy suggests. So they were probably, well, they were definitely covered by filamentous feathers all over their bodies, and adults sported large wings, whereas juveniles did not have wings. So these animals are very large. They're between three and a half and four meters long when adult, weighed several hundred pounds, so they're too large to fly. So what could, wing, what could a wing have been useful for in animals that big? And does the discovery of feather of wings in ornithomimids allow us to select one of the three theories or one of the three hypotheses that had been suggested for the origin of wings? Well, if you look at all those scenarios, they're all very different. They all try to explain wings evolving in a different manner, but they all have one thing in common. They all state that wings should have been in, uh, present at all stage of, of life, so from juveniles all the way to adults. But in ornithomimids, we saw that juveniles do not have a wing. So our discovery of the ornithomimids is inconsistent with any of those three main hypotheses that had been suggested for the origin of wings. So this means we have to come up with an alternative uh, hypothesis to explain the origin of wings. So what can the presence of wings in an adult, but its absence in a juvenile, tell us about wing function or wing origin in dinosaurs and wing function in ornithomimids? Well, for that, we need to look at uh, basically the rate of development of wings in, in birds. Since basically we have ornithomimids that are at least a year old and don't have wings, we have to look at the rate of development of wings in birds. In other words, is it common in birds to have animals that are a year old and still don't have a wing? And the answer is no. Birds, uh, wings develop extremely fast in uh, the life of a bird. If you look at flying birds, you can see that wings are fully formed within a matter of days to weeks after hatching. As you can see here in that 12-day-old partridge, you can see it already has a fully formed wing. And that's understandable because a rapidly f developing wing is critical for their survival. These animals need to leave the nest in order to s search food and become independent from their parents. So that's why they need a fully functional wing really soon after hatching. If we look at ground-dwelling birds, we can see that their wings develop slightly slower, but still, wings are formed within a matter of weeks to months after hatching, as you can see in that three-month-old ostrich that already has wings. So we can see that wings in birds develop fairly soon after hatching. In ornithomimids, we have a juvenile that's a year old and still doesn't show a hint of, a, of a shafted feathers or of a, of a wing. So that's telling us that in ornithomimids, wings probably took a matter of years to develop. So they took very, very long. Juveniles did not have them, and it took several years for wings to develop. So what, what can a, such a slow development rate of wings could mean for wing function? Well, if we look at uh, the modern world, we can see that a slow development rate for a feature, meaning something that takes years to develop, is diagnostic or typical of what we call a secondary sexual characteristics. That's a feature that usually develops late during ontogeny, so late in life, usually in response to sexual maturity or puberty. And good examples of secondary sexual characteristics are the lion's mane and the trunk of an elephant seal. So the lion's mane starts growing at about the age of a year and a half and stops growing at the age of five. If you look at the trunk in male elephant seals, you can see it starts developing at the age of four and is fully grown by the age of nine. And it's only at the end of that growth period that the animal reaches sexual maturity and is of age uh, to reproduce. So the fact that the wings of ornithomimids took several years to develop means that they were probably secondary sexual characteristics. So what does that mean about wing function in ornithomimids if they are secondary sexual characteristics? Well, we can look at modern ostriches in order to gain insight into how ornithomimids could have used their wings. They could have used their wings for courtship and display to try to impress a mate. They could have used their wings to try to scare away a competitor could have used their wings maybe for brooding 
or for protecting their offspring. So in other words, wings would have been useful only later in life once the animal was uh, sexually mature. And juveniles, since they did not practice any of those behaviors, did not need them. So that's why wings were not uh, present in these animals. So what does the presence of wings as secondary sexual characteristics could mean for the evolution of wings among dinosaurs? Well, if we look at a very simplified family tree of uh, meat-eating dinosaurs with the most primitive ones at the top and the most derived ones, the most evolved ones at the bottom, we can see that ornithomimids are, and we look at the distribution of feathers and wings in these animals, we can see that ornithomimids are the most primitive dinosaurs to have possessed wings. And species that possessed wings for flight or for gliding occurred much later on in terms of an evolutionary term. So the fact that the most primitive dinosaurs to have possessed wings use them as secondary sexual characteristics means that primitive wings probably did not evolve for flight, for gliding, or for any type of locomotory uh, behavior. It probably evolved just for show, for display, and for courtship. And it's only later on during evolution that wings were co-opted for other functions and eventually for flight. So in conclusion, it's amazing to see that specimens that were discovered just recently here in Alberta actually give us, give paleontologists a new perspective on the evolution of wings and as a, uh, as a consequence, the evolution of birds as well. So we see that the presence of wings in adult ornithomimids and the, uh, their absence in juvenile ornithomimids tells us that wings, the, the primitive wings, did not evolve in response to selective pressure for flight, gliding, or to escape predators. Instead, it tells us that primitive wings, the first wings to evolve among dinosaurs, were actually, uh, actually evolved in response to sexual selection for courtship and for display. So in other words, wings first evolved for show, and then later on, basically through evolution, realized that if you start growing your wings earlier, made them a little bit bigger, then they could actually start being used for other purposes. And eventually, it's through evolution that wings were actually co-opted, so used for later uh, purpose uh, in time. And eventually, flight was the ultimate uh, purpose uh, that was uh, used for wings. So I'd like to thank a bunch of collaborators who helped me uh, different, uh, through the different projects. Lots of technicians also helped in the retrieving the blocks and preparing it, obviously. I'd like to thank also landowners, Paul Andrew from Kirkpatrick and the town of Drumheller, who allowed us to go retrieve those very significant specimens. And finally, thank you all for being here today. <laughs>